Hello. In my last session, I introduced the various specialists who may be involved in dealing with archaeological finds, and I mentioned the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Now, this was introduced alongside the Treasure Act in 1997, and it was a voluntary scheme. The Treasure Act is statutory, but the Portable Antiquities Scheme was a voluntary scheme designed to encourage people who'd found objects to report them. It was introduced as a pilot, so successful, it was very soon rolled out across England and Wales. Now, England and Wales, because there are slightly different procedures in Northern Ireland and, and in Scotland. How does it work? Well, objects found can be reported to a fines liaison officer. There are 41 of these around the country. For Staffordshire and the West Midlands, the fines liaison officer is based in Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. For Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, the fines liaison officer is based in Derby Museum and Art Gallery. They will provide feedback to individuals at identification days and fine surgeries. So members of the public who perhaps dug something up in the garden or found something can take it in and they'll be given an interpretation and the fines liaison officer will record it and all the fines get entered on a database. It's available online, it's searchable, www.fines.org.uk and what these fines build up to is a very good archae archaeological picture of a local area and the fines liaison officers link in very closely with metal detecting clubs usually go along to their monthly meetings. It's a really valuable process but of course museums always struggling for resources so it is it is vulnerable. To follow the process I'm going to tell you one particular example. 1999 two members of Ipswich and District Metal Detecting Club were working in a, a field near Thwaite in Suffolk and they found a metal cross about three inches long, dull brown, couldn't really tell what the metal was and, and quite corroded. But they took it along to their monthly meeting and the fines liaison officer had a look at it and you could just make out the faint figure, a faint figure on the cross. Now a figure on a cross suggests it's a Christian item and in this case the fines liaison officer took it away for further examination and he consulted the British Museum. They confirmed that it was a figure of Christ, dressed in a knee-length tunic and with a manus day, a hand of God above. It was the upper half of a medieval reliquary. There would once have been another half and there were signs of where the hinges and clasp had broken off. Whatever the relic had been inside it was missing, but a loop on the top of the cross suggested it was perhaps worn around the neck. It's similar to other examples, all of which date to the late 11th, 12th centuries, so the period after the Norman Conquest. British Museum scientists used non-destructive testing, uh, it's a technique called X-ray fluorescence, to ascertain exactly what it was made of, and it turned out to be 53% silver, and had once been gilded. There were slight traces of the gilding still remaining and the engraving had been picked out in Niello. Now this is a, a mix of sulphur, silver, copper and lead made into a paste, put into the engraving and then heat treated. 53% silver, so treasure as defined by the Treasure Act, more than 10% silver or gold, over 300 years old. Uh, it has to go to the coroner and the British Museum wrote a report for the coroner and indicated whether they wanted to acquire the cross. They did. Then the Treasury Valuation Committee met at the British Museum to decide the value and that would go to the finders and the landowner half each. What criteria did they base the valuation on? Well they look at the rarity of an object they look at its historical importance, they look at its collectability and for that they will probably consult with the leading auction houses and also look at the condition 
and these factors will affect the decision. In this case they valued the Thwaite Cross at £1,500. Now all these decisions can be appealed of course. Where did the British Museum get the money from to acquire these objects? Well they do have their own specific funds set aside but they can also tap into other sources such as the National Art Collecting Fund. It would now be the job at the British Museum of a conservator to clean and assess the item, work out how best to store it and then for the exhibition team to think about how best to display it and to work with the curator on an accompanying text. Now, now in my introductory taster I mentioned the spectacular finds at Sutton Hoo and I'm going to return to those. Sutton Hoo is a heathy ridge. The ridge is the Hoobit. It's overlooking the River Deben estuary and on the opposite bank is the historic river port of Woodbridge. It's about eight miles from the sea. It's navigable and it was the burial place of East Anglian aristocracy for a period of around 50 years from the late 6th century to the early 7th century. It was later used for more common burials. It also became an execution site. But for those 50 years, late 6th, early 7th century, it was high status burials. And the burial mounds were particularly visible to anyone who's going to arrive by sea. This is making a powerful statement. Somebody powerful lives here. Where did the people live who were buried here? Probably about two miles upstream. We know there was a royal palace at a place called Rendlesham. Now several mounds had been looted in the past and it prompted the landowner, uh, Edith Pretty, who wanted to know more about the mounds anyway, to approach Ipswich Corporation to see if they could be excavated. And the corporation agreed to release Basil Brown, a self-taught archaeologist, and he began excavating in the summer of 1938. Mrs Pretty, as part of the agreement, had to pay Basil Brown's wages while he was on site. His wages were 30 shillings a week. And although the mounds had been disturbed, there were still objects to be found. So they were coming up with metal ornaments, fragments of iron weapons, enough to indicate they were dealing with Anglo-Saxon burials. Work stopped for the winter and began again in summer 1939. And then the more exciting finds began. A trench was dug through the largest mound and they uncovered some iron ship rivets. The pattern of the riv rivets revealed that it was a ship. The wood had rotted away but it left a clear image in the soil. A fragile image but an image nonetheless and it was a boat 90 feet long. And there were all rests there for around 40 maybe a few more oarsmen. And in the centre of the boat, a large roof chamber had collapsed, but inside it, there was an undisturbed grave. You could imagine when this burial took place, been dated to the early part of the 7th century. You can imagine a kind of state funeral with this great ship being hauled up the ridge and buried in the mound. Would have been quite a sight. And although this mound had been plundered in the past, Miraculously, the looters had not dug deep enough and they'd not dug in the right place. And ploughing had changed the shape of the mound. So the centre of the mound was not where you might think it would be if I'm looking at uh, how it appeared today. Now this was an important find and the British Museum took over, Charles Phillips and a team of archaeologists. And then the treasures began to appear. But 1939, they're having to work quickly because war is very much on the horizon. Recover what they can, record it and photograph it. They came up with fragments of textiles, there were weapons, there was armour, there were buckets, bowls and cauldrons, gold ornaments inlaid with garnets. After the excavation, uh, the ship impression was protected, it was recovered again and all the finds went to the British Museum. There they were recorded before they had to be returned to, to Sutton for the coroner's inquest. Now that took place in the local village hall in August 1939. 
and the coroner decided that under the old law of treasure trove, all the items belonged to Mrs Pretty. The next month the east coast is militarised for war, the site was used as a training ground for tanks and for armoured vehicles, and for safety all the finds were stored in Aldwych tube station on the London Underground. And then after the war, the British Museum got down to the detailed work of a, a research programme to understand exactly what these artefacts meant. In the 1960s, the ship was re-excavated and plaster casts were taken. The National Trust acquired the site in 1996 and an exhibition centre opened in 2002 and they have some of the finds there and others are replicas. The rest is in the British Museum in Gallery 41. At the exhibition centre is a reconstruction of what the burial chamber originally looked like. So if we go back to the finds there was no trace of a skeleton, which has led some people to theorise that maybe it was an empty tomb, a cenotaph, maybe somebody lost at sea. But the way that the ornaments that would have been on a body were laid out very much suggested that there had been a body there and it was just the acidity in the soil had destroyed all the remains. Uh, there was a long wooden bier oriented east to west which is believed where the, the body lay. And the number of jewelled gold fittings are exquisite craftsmanship, but they would have shown exactly where the body laid. There's a large gold belt buckle with zoomorphic interlace. It's about five and a half inches long. It has three bosses on it. There were two shoulder straps, probably from a military surcoat each clasp symmetrically curved pieces, meticulously engineered hinge, sophisticated flawless garnet croissonne and milfiori glass, all set in a stepped carpet of geometric gold cells and each of these cells had been lined with gold foil to make the garnet shine. This is a detail there was a belt and a purse. This is the lid, decorated with hawks, wolves and human figures. This has got a gold filigree frame, again with Mirfiori glass and an inner border of garnets and three hinges. The purse contained 37 gold coins, all from different Frankish mints and there were two small gold ingots. The coins date from a period 572 to 625. Near where the head would have been there was a limewood shield covered with hide and with a jewelled eagle and a dragon ornament. The wood and the hide had all but disappeared but the fittings remained. And this is the reconstruction with the original ornaments fitted. It's about three feet across. It's gilded bronze around the edge, that's the binding. The centre boss is iron and there's an iron grip on the reverse. And the ornamentation is all gilded bronze. This is a detail of the design on the centre boss. This is the dragon and the eagle with their garnet decoration. And on the eagle's hip, the garnets make a face. Near the shield, there was a strange symbolic whetstone made into a scepter. You can see the original alongside a replica here, topped with a stag. There were also a set of ten Byzantine shallow silver bowls. These are about eight and a half inches in diameter and an equal armed cross runs from below the rim, decorated with a star motif, and in the centre is an inscribed roundel with an eight-petalled rose. And these bowls came with spoons. There was also a beaver skin bag. Beavers, of course, were native, but hunted to extinction in the 16th century, hunted for fur, for meat, for medicine. And 
What had been inside the bag was a lyre and fragments of those were found, mostly made of maple, the strings would have been gut, and there was enough there to enable the British Museum to make a replica. Where the feet would have been were two silver dishes and the remains of a folded heap of clothes, shoes, cushions and a ring-mailed coat made of welded and riveted iron rings. This is a replica. By the knees were drinking horns and wooden cups with ornamental mounts. These horns would have held around four pints. I know what you're thinking, it's not enough. This cup was a squashed but made from walnut, uh, burr walnut wood with a silver gilt decorative rim. Against the east wall of the chamber were cauldrons, an elaborate iron chain for suspending the cauldron over a hearth and various wooden tubs and buckets, all bound with decorative ironwork. This is the largest of the hanging balls. It's gilded bronze, it's about 12 inches diameter, five and a half inches deep. It had elaborate mounts with these Celtic triskeles in red enamel and milfiori glass. The suspension chain was 10 feet long, so you can imagine the size of the hall that this would have hung from a crossbeam in the ceiling suspended over a fire. Also in the grave was a pattern welded sword with a jewelled hilt, spears and an axe. The wear on the handle of the sword shows that its owner was left-handed. Swords are the ultimate warrior accoutrement. Knives and axes can also be tools. Spears and bows can be used for hunting. A sword has only one purpose. It's a killing tool. There was also a game with some bone gaming pieces and of course the famous helmet. Iron, tinned copper alloy, several pieces of iron forming the cap, the cheek pieces, the mask and the neck guard, all covered with panels of tinned copper alloy. Stamped with various patterns, including animal interlace and warrior motifs. The warrior motifs are known as the dancing warriors and the fallen warrior. You can see them here on this drawing. And this is a replica. A gilded crest runs over the cap and down the face forming the nose. The nose, moustache and eyebrows combine with the crest in the shape of a bird. The crest has animal terminals with cloisonne garnet eyes. Gold foil behind the garnets above the right eye only would have made it gleam and shine. Now Odin was famously one-eyed. He gave up his left eye in return for knowledge. Some reference here I think. And the iron crest and the bronze eyebrows are inlaid with silver wire. The eyebrows have gilt zoomorphic terminals consisting of boar's heads and again strips of garnet cloisonne work immediately above the eye sockets. And the nose and the mouthpiece are cast as one with engraved detail and silver inlay. The replica was made by the Royal Armouries. Who is the man in the grave? Royal. Coins and other finds date from the time of Radwald. He was the King of East Anglia from around 599 to 625, so he is the most likely candidate. Now Bede tells us that when Augustus's mission from Pope Gregory arrived in Kent in 597, that Radwald was invited to meet the missionaries by uh, King Ethelbert and was baptised. Interestingly, we have a burial here with grave goods, so it is pagan, but the orientation east-west. So perhaps this is Radwald and he's hedging his bets when he's got back to, to Suffolk, running Christianity and paganism in parallel. The silver Byzantine bowls and spoons also have a Christian inscription. They have a tiny cross and they're scribed with the names Saulos and Paulos. They might well have been baptismal gifts. Byzantine bowls from the Eastern Mediterranean. Where did the garnets come from? Probably India and Pakistan. 
the Frankish coins from modern day France, Spain and Germany. Some of the textiles turned out to be from Syria. 27 different types of textile were identified. It shows what a long distance connection there was between East Anglia and the rest of, of Europe at the time and what a connected trading world that this man lived in. The objects at Sutton Hoo were deliberately buried. They were intended to stay there for eternity to accompany this man in the afterlife. Other objects end up in the ground for different reasons. Some discarded, broken, no longer useful, pottery. Others are accidentally lost. Some items are buried for safekeeping. It's the job of historians and archaeologists to work out the most plausible explanation. With Sutton Hoo it was clear that the goods found were grave goods. It is not always so obvious and I'm going to return to that topic in our next session. If you've enjoyed this video hit the like and subscribe buttons and click the notification bell to be informed when the next video is published.